So, uh, yeah, we're here to talk a little bit about uh, Vendetta Online, our space MMORPG, and uh, how the process of bringing that to the daydream. So, Vendetta Online is a uh, massively multiplayer space game, been live for a number of years, and we're completely cross-platform, so basically all platforms that we are available on can all compete against one another in a single persistent universe. Uh, and that's been kind of like a, an important core focus and core part of the design from the very beginning. Uh, especially as we moved into mobile and things like that, that somebody could play on a PC, then you know jump in on a mobile device as they were you know on public transportation, and that's further been extended into the VR world. So we're really excited about bringing that kind of level of immersion into the game and uh, and improving the player experience that much more. So uh, we've started out uh, over the years. We were one of the first to uh, to move on VR back in uh, 2013 uh, when uh, Oculus first started kind of getting up and running. We've been continuing to evolve and improve the design of the game for VR over that time. And then we uh, we began formal retail launches onto VR over the past six months or so, uh, beginning with Gear VR, Daydream, and then we'll, we'll be coming back to, to PC platforms after that with like a, a more intensely dialed up version of the engine. And, uh, you know, continuing to try and, uh, and drive the most immersive, intense VR space experience that we possibly can find. It's been uh, very well received so far uh, on Gear VR. You know, that's kind of our initial test case. Um, we do recommend playing with like a, a full-size Bluetooth controller if you're using mobile VR if possible. Although in both cases, Gear VR and Daydream, um, it is completely compatible with like the base user experience control setup. So that's that's a, a great way to try out the game. Uh, but for those who are really looking for the advanced gameplay experience, something like a Steel Series or a Razer controller, some sort of Bluetooth controller is, is a good idea. So the Daydream controller is definitely a uh, a significant advantage and a significant step forward, especially for a relatively lightweight uh, you know VR experience in terms of it being a mobile VR experience. Having the persistency of that controller and the ability to point at different things and, and use it for different controls has been really nice. So for instance, um, one of our adaptations was we wanted to make it that much easier to do object selection for remote targets or uh, remote objects you want to mine or, or just as you're exploring the universe. And the ability to, to do that kind of thing with the controller, turn it into a laser pointer, you know, and kind of point it around and have different objects be highlighted as it, as it strikes them. Uh, that really made things a little bit more intuitive, we feel, for our users. And, uh, and I think that's going to be a substantial asset to, to the gameplay in general. Gear VR and Daydream, while from a, a user standpoint they're, they're very, very similar, at a technical level they actually work a little bit differently. And uh, there were some engine changes, both low level and, and high level, to try and optimize that much better for Daydream. Um, and there are also some user experience changes. Obviously the controller is, is the most self-evident of those. There were other things that would come up during Daydream development about you know, hey, while we're doing this, uh, wouldn't it be easier to make like mining a little bit more pleasant for people or, or some sp specific area of gameplay and how we can try and craft and optimize this specifically for the Daydream audience. So that, that has been part of the focus. Oh, we'll definitely be coming back to PC VR. Um, mobile VR, for one thing, you know, it, it was... Uh, Part of the priority of these different platforms is based on the way that we're approached by the, the people who are developing the platforms, you know. So Oculus came to us on the Gear VR, you know, we heard from Google on the Daydream and the like. We have very strong plans to uh, to launch onto the Oculus Store and onto Steam VR and, uh, and onto the, the HTC Vive. Um, and a big part of that is we really want to deliver uh, an, an incredible graphical experience on those platforms, which is different from the challenges that you run into on mobile VR. You know, mobile VR is all about the scalability. Can you get the frame rate? Can you get like that that core experience to work really, really well on a mobile device? Whereas when you're you're coming over to the big higher end gaming systems, you know, there's there's a lot more horsepower available and you really want to try and do things a little bit differently, you know, use that uh, that power a little a little differently. So uh, we're we're excited to play around with you know lighting models and things and shadows and stuff a, a little more extremely and uh, and really get the uh, the introductory experience that we've we've always wanted. Plus, we also want to support things like Oculus Touch and some of the evolving uh, control uh, paradigms. All of these motion controls are 
very have a great deal of potential for advancement and a great deal of potential for, for interesting new, uh, new ways of interacting with the games. One of the things I'm most interested in is the evolution of haptics and how that will kind of move in the future. You know, how are we able to give people more feedback? And, and to a certain extent, just controls in general. I mean, at least having them in the hands, that, that allows you to give that feeling of, you know, really reaching out and touching, really interacting with your environment a little bit more. Be it in a space game with like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm like moving some UI constructs around or I'm doing this or that. Or, or in something that's you know a little bit more granular, where you're you're really kind of you need to interact with the environment uh, frequently. Um, I really want to see that evolve also into the direction of, of haptics and uh, and more direct feedback to the user. So we'll be continuing to examine that, those things as they move forward and play around with them. the interaction side of things in terms of getting the user and their limbs into the game in a more robust way is really the focus, or should be the focus, of the next 18 months for, for a lot of different companies, be they on the hardware side or the software side. For those of us that have been working on VR for a long time, for a number of years, that was always the contention. As soon as you put on a VR headset on, on someone who's never used it before and show them some demo with a butterfly flying around, they immediately reach out and go, oh, you know. And that's, it's always been kind of like half the experience, and the other half the experience is really the interactivity. I give Google a lot of credit for, you know, how they started out with a controller at the very least. It's, it's something. Um, but, uh, but I'm really looking forward to see how that moves ahead. Uh, you know that there's the leap motion guys with their their you know the ability to to see your hands kind of thing. Uh, and there's all these motion controller different people that are trying different things. You know there's rumors of various and sundry other types of uh, of input that may be on the horizon. And I think it will be much more about input interactivity. Or I, th I think that's more critical than it is strictly increasing frame rate, increasing you know resolution. You know it's like these things are great. They, they definitely improve the immersion, but uh, we really need to get the user more invested and more involved in the world around them. The challenge, be it standalone or smartphone based, they're really fundamentally the same hardware. You know, uh, it, it's just phone chips in a different configuration. So it has the benefit of being completely standalone and being completely wire free uh, and, and using relatively low power, but there also isn't the compute potential of doing anything really, really complicated. Um, so I'd say the opportunity on both PC and mobile for better user input, better feedback, better haptics, better all these sorts of things is about equal, you know, because really whether it's a Bluetooth device or, or whether it's a wired device or whatever it is, getting the input into the device isn't that intensive, getting, you know, you aren't really probably doing too much on the CPU. It's mostly just about getting the right devices that are attached to the user in the right way that's intuitive for them, and then getting it to people like me to try and find innovative ways of applying the software to really use it and get that experience.